Hey, we're Anna Jennifer Smith with Marriage After God. Helping you cultivate an extraordinary marriage. And today we're going to talk about what God loves. Welcome to the Marriage After God podcast, where we believe that marriage was meant for more than just happily ever after. I'm Jennifer, also known as Unveiled Wife. And I'm Aaron, also known as Husband Revolution. We have been married for over a decade. And so far, we have four young children. We have been doing marriage ministry online for over seven years through blogging and social media. With the desire to inspire couples to keep God at the center of their marriage, encouraging them to walk in faith every day. We believe that Christian marriage should be an extraordinary one, full of life, love, and power that can only be found by chasing after God. Together. Thank you for joining us on this journey as we chase boldly after God's will for our life together. This is Marriage After God. Hey, thanks for joining us on a new episode. New week, new episode. Uh, We're glad to have you. Uh, We like to call you guys our Marriage After God family. So thanks for being a part of this show. You guys mean a lot to us. Uh, And before we get into the topic today, we want to invite you, if you have not done so already, to leave us a review. Uh, A star rating is the easiest way to do it. All you got to do is scroll to the bottom of the podcast app, choose a star rating, and boom, you're done. Or you can go even a little further and you can leave us a written review, which we love to read. And those reviews, those star ratings help new listeners find us. It's how all these podcast apps rank our show based off of reviews and downloads. So we'd really appreciate it if you took a moment and uh, left us a review. Another thing we want to let you guys know about, if you also haven't done this already, is the Marriage Prayer Challenge. We created this challenge for you as a way just to inspire your prayer life. Um, If you are interested, it's really easy to sign up, marriageprayerchallenge.com. It's completely free and you'll get 30 emails, uh, 31 emails every day, reminding you and giving you prompts for what to pray for, for your spouse. Not 31 emails a day, but... No, not 31 emails a day. You'll get 31 email. emails, one a day. One a day for yeah. 31 days. And it's pretty awesome. We've had hundreds and hundreds of people already sign up for it. Uh, so we just want to invite you. It's completely free, marriageprayerchallenge.com and uh, take the challenge. All right. So Aaron, you... You came up with this topic today. You felt inspired to talk about what God loves. Um, Before we jump into maybe what inspired you, uh, just off the top of your head, without looking at our notes or anything like that, what does God love? The when I was thinking about this, the first thing that came to mind was the most famous verse of all, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world Mm. that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. So that was the first thing I thought. I was like, oh, he loves loves his creation. He loves his people, mm. the ones that he made in his image. Uh, so that was the first thing I thought of when That's I cool. um, was thinking about uh, going through these these verses we're going to go through today, mm-hmm. which now that we're into the topic, <laughs> uh, the idea of this episode was um, it came out of s- some Bible reading I was doing the other day. And I was reading in Psalms uh, chapter 37, and there was a line in there that says, and I think, I believe it's verse 28 and it says for the Lord loves justice. Mm. And so I was reading in that I've, I've read that a lot in the past and I've, I've read in other places where it talks about what God loves, but there was a moment that I said, Oh, this is literally telling me one of the things that God specifically loves. It's not just talking about in general, it's saying the Lord loves this. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I thought that was a pretty impressive thing that the, the Bible told us something that God loves. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I, I thought to myself, I was like, I wonder how many other places it tells us what God loves. Using the specific terms, the Lord loves or God loves or the Father loves in regards to the God the Father. Uh, so I, I did that. I kind of did some research and I dug through and I found some cool verses. And I just thought this would be a fun uh, episode to discuss the things that God loves and I kind of also thought, like, if God loves it, maybe we should too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this reminds me of, I don't know if our listeners read Jeremy and Audrey's book, A Love Letter Life, but there's a part of it that I just really love, a chapter about um, the principle of sharing. And it's yeah, this idea that this if, bit, yeah. if your spouse loves something or likes something or has a hobby, you know, of some sort, um, then that means that there's something to love about it or something to like about it. And so it kind of reminds me of this same concept. If God loves something, 
there's something to love about it. <laughs> and so we should be paying yeah. attention. And probably not just something when it comes to God. It's like the thing oh, right. we should love probably. Right. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure most of these as we go through and we'll be like, yeah, we, we love like that. But mm-hmm. I guess the question we should ask ourselves as we read through these is, do we truly love mm-hmm. the things that God loves? Uh, and at least start a you know prayer journey. I say, okay, Lord, like, do I love these things? Mm-hmm. And what does it look like to love these things? And why do you love them? And I don't know, maybe it'll cause our listeners to dig in the word of, to the word of God and find out for themselves. Well, why do you think it would be important for us to acknowledge or tune into what God loves? Why does it matter? Well, I, 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 th- I th- believe there's probably a lot of Christians out there that say they love God, say they love Jesus. Uh, but oftentimes the, the love is this one way kind of love. Like we love the idea of mm-hmm. God or Jesus or like, oh, that, you know, the mighty power or whatever we want to call it. But like as a Christian, I, I know that there's varying maturity levels and someone might say they love God. But it's a much different kind of love when you love what they love. Like if you, if I say I love God, then I'm going to love the things that God loves. If I say I love Jesus, uh, Jesus even says himself, if you love me, you will obey me. Mm-hmm. And for you, us to obey Jesus is to essentially love the things he loves and hate the things he hates. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if he loves us loving our neighbors, then he hates us hating our neighbors, mm-hmm. right? That's a, a simple uh, contrast. But I just think if we love God, wouldn't we want to know what he loves, mm-hmm. who he is, what he's about? I That's, was just good. I was just going to say this is what's in, already inspiring me and encouraging me about this episode is that it's a way of getting to know God in a very yeah. specific way, and like you said, getting to know what it is he loves. And you know, it's, if our prayer is that our hearts are aligned with his and we are transformed to be like him, then we will love the things that he loves. Yeah, and I, I think about it. The reason it was it, it surprised me so much when it said the Lord loves X, mm-hmm. you know, this thing. I just kind of imagine it like if I was to sit with you, Jennifer, and say, "Babe, would you write down just things you love?" Which I think we should do. I think that'd be a little cool exercise. Mm-hmm. Like, what do you love? Like, and it doesn't have to be an exhaustive, like all million things that you love. But if you were just to boil down the simplest things that you love in life, um, and then you, I, I think, like, how cool is it that God did that? Yeah, God kind of gave us his not definitive list of things he loves, but he writes down very specific specific things that he loves. And we're going to dig into those. And of course, you've heard one of them. We'll talk about that in a little bit. uh, Justice. Uh, But uh, I just I think that's really cool. Oh, I I was listening to a pastor uh, talking about um, going back to the idea of Christians saying they love God, but maybe not the things he loves. Mm -hmm. Um, He was talking about uh, people who say they love God, Christians, but they say things like, oh, I don't need doctrine and theology. I just need Jesus. Like, I don't need the specific words. I just need this idea. And he was saying, he's like, the the problem with that is if we say we love God, don't we want to get to know him? Mm-hmm. And the only way to get to know him is through doctrine and theology, his word. His word, yeah. The word of God. That's That's the written manuscript, the written document he gave us of who he is, uh, which is pretty powerful to think about. And so why don't we, we're going to dig through and there's uh, a handful of verses we're going to talk about, and then we're just going to discuss them. I'm going to read the verse and then we'll talk about maybe why he loves that, uh, just what it means to us and how we could love those same things maybe. Okay. So when I, um, when I was going through our notes for this episode and you know, you had, you've been so inspired by this topic. The first thing that I thought about was Psalms 36, seven, how precious is your steadfast love? Oh God. I love that. Like how precious is it? So even the fact that we're studying it, it's like, yeah. we got to remember that it's it's steadfast. It's, um, it endures forever. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just, I oh, I love God's love. Okay. And I, I also want to say that that steadfast love, I mean, mm-hmm. it's unchanging. Mm-hmm. So the things that we're going to bring up, when it says that he loves them, mm-hmm. he's unchanging. He still loves those yeah, things. Yeah, he still loves it. Even though they're maybe in the Old Testament uh, in some of these verses. God, what God loves, he still loves. Yeah. He doesn't change those things. Uh, okay, so. I know you already mentioned it, but let's just start. Yeah, the first over. verse <laughs> we're going to talk about is John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The world meaning? The, yeah, it's not talking people, about the, mankind. the system of the world. Yeah. Of course, it's talking about mankind. It's talking about God's creation 
as man mm -hmm. the in his own image. He loves mankind so much that he gave his only son. And we know this because then it says whoever, meaning men mm -hmm. or women, right. believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Uh, so I think, first of all, if God loved the world so much to give his only son, what, how, how much do you think we should love people? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. And I, I think a lot of Christians gravitate toward this a lot of saying like, you know, we just need to love people. We just mm -hmm. need to love people, which is awesome. But I think the the level of love that this is saying, even to death, like sending a son to redeem mm -hmm. mankind, not just to love them where they're at, but to actually give them a way out mm -hmm. of the, the, the trap of death and mm -hmm. sin that we were um, put under bondage to because of Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. He sent his son to give us freedom to save his people. Not just like, oh, I love you. Here's my, I, my son's dead now. No, it's, there was a purpose behind it. He loved people so much mm -hmm. that he sent his son, Jesus, to die the death that his people that he created deserve mm -hmm. so that his people that deserve to die and be in wrath don't have to, to preserve them, to save them, to redeem them through his son's blood mm -hmm. and death and miraculously his resurrection, which then also gives his people, the world that he loves so much, new life in him. And I think that's really powerful. So when I when we talk about how much we should love the world, is it like the superficial love of just saying like, oh, I love you? Or is it, you know, like it tells us in First Thessalonians that we are ministers of reconciliation. You yeah. Know, we love them so much that we're going to tell them about Jesus. Right. And it, <laughs> and it's not just that he loves Christians because Romans 5, 8 tells us, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right. Like he, he loves, loves all, people. all people. All people. Yeah. But the love that he has is a redemptive love, yeah. not beautiful. a leaving as you are love. Yeah. Um, so our love should be the same. It should be a redemptive love of we love you because God created you in his, his image. And so I can't look at any person and say, you're not lovable. Mm -hmm. You're not worthy. Like you just said in the beginning, if God loves a person, then there's something in them to love. Mm -hmm. And if it's the if it's the only thing that's in them is the image of God, that's way more than enough, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Because every human being bears the image of God. Mm -hmm. They're created in his likeness. But the way we love is it in truth and in spirit. And so we we present in love who Christ is to people because that's the most loving thing we could do. So I, I, I just thought this one's a powerful one to, con to, to think about. God loves his people. Yeah. Not just Christians, but the people he created. All yeah. people, all men. Hey, Marriage After God family. Uh, we wanted to take a short moment to let you know about an organization that we believe in and support. Did you know that there are more than 4 million victims of sex trafficking globally? And 99% of those are women and children. As a Christian and as a father, this truth breaks my heart. What if those were my children? What if that was my wife? Thank God there are Christ-centered organizations out there that are making a difference. Destiny Rescue is an international recognized Christian nonprofit organization dedicated to rescuing children trapped in exploitation and the sex trade. Their vision is to rescue the sexually exploited and enslaved, restore the abused, protect the vulnerable, empower the poor, and be a voice for those who can't speak up for themselves. They currently work in seven countries around the world and have celebrated over 4,000 lives rescued from the evils of sex exploitation. Destiny Rescue has operations in Thailand, Cambodia, the Dominican Republic, and the Philippines, India, and other locations that remain undisclosed for security purposes. Since 2011, they've been working tirelessly to free children from exploitation around the world. They have helped keep hundreds more from entering the sex trade through the various prevention programs, ensured justice for those who have been wronged, and raised awareness to untold numbers. My family supports Destiny Rescue on a monthly basis, and we want to invite you to join us in saving and protecting children from this wicked industry. Visit destinyrescue.org today and become a monthly partner with us. Thank you. Okay, why don't you read the next verse and then we'll talk okay. about it. The next one is 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Here's another one. This is very specific. Is it God loves, <laughs> what does he love? A cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. We so we've talked about this in the past mm -hmm. and get in episodes on generosity. Or finances, yeah. Or finances. And the Bible's very clear about giving. Mm -hmm. We should do it. 
but then he's also, it's also very clear how we should do it without reluctancy, without compulsion, meaning someone's not coming to me and saying, you must give. And if you don't give, you're not a, mm -hmm. right? No, it's, I have a desire in my heart to give and I'm gonna, I want to do it joyfully, cheerfully. Like I'm happy to give yeah. this portion, whatever I'm going to give. I'm so cheerful to give this mm -hmm. because I know where my reward lies. It's in heaven, not with man, not in my bank account, not in my house. So it, it even talks about this in the Old Testament when it talked about the, the tabernacle be, being built. God over and over and over again, when he's giving the instructions on what should be given, he gives this command to give, but only to those who had a heart to do so which is pretty powerful to think about. Now, I wouldn't have wanted to been the only one in that community, in, the, in the, the Jewish community, not giving to the first tabernacle. Everyone, it sounds like everyone did, but they all gave out of a, a, a willing heart is what it says. They were wanting to give, they were willing to give, they were ready and they gave whatever they could for the fulfillment of that tabernacle, the first tabernacle. And so I think it's really awesome that God loves a cheerful giver. What, what would you say someone could take from this who maybe is afraid of giving or doesn't like giving because of where they're at financially? Like, how could they be encouraged by this? Well, I think the first thing um, is just to acknowledge that it says a cheerful giver. And there's lots of things we can give. We can mm -hmm. give our money, our resources, our time, our energy, our effort, mm -hmm. our, our love. Right. So possessions. our possessions, there's a lot of things that we can give in life. And so my my question or my challenge would be to our listeners, um, consider where your heart's at today when it comes to giving and the opportunities God gives you to give. And are you someone who um, has decided in his heart to be a cheerful giver? Because you know what? God loves a cheerful giver. Loves him. And that I makes me want to stop and think, am I Am I being cheerful when I yeah. give? I, I would actually give a warning also. If you are desiring to give, but it's out of a, a reluctant heart, like, oh, I don't really want to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Or a compulsion, like, oh, if I don't do this, then so-and-so is going to judge me. Don't or you do it. Or you end up, oh, I was going to say, or you end up don't giving, you don't give and you're withholding because of those feelings. Like that's not going to make you feel good. No, but I, what I would say, if they are feeling those things, it'd be better not to give. Mm. And pray about it and say, okay, Lord, I, my heart isn't right. Change me, God. Change me, God. <laughs> and have cheerfulness. Yeah. Or give at a level that you can be cheerful about it. Yeah. Right? Here, here's, to practice giving with a cheerful attitude. Here's another kind of layer to this that I want to add. Um, because we're a marriage podcast, consider this in light of your spouse. Ooh. How do you give to them? I don't know why I just felt super convicted in my own relationship with you, Aaron, and and how I give to you or how I don't give to you. And are you a cheerful I, in marriage? It's a good question for us to ask. I should don't be. answer it. <laughs> uh, that's a that's a great question. I think yeah. in their marriage, uh, consider the way are you, you a cheerful giver to your spouse? Well, and, th and consider the different ways you give to your spouse on a daily basis and what that looks like, and just spend some time thinking about it. Yeah, and. If you're ever concerned about like, well, if I give, what does that mean? Like, how's God going to help me like, to, or take care of me or these things, right? Don't give with expectation. <laughs> well, I would, what I was going to say is at least know this. God loves it when you do it cheerfully. Oh, man. Right? That's good. So I would say dig into the word of God and find out yeah. what he says about it more. Mm -hmm. But yeah, at minimum, God loves it mm -hmm. when we give out of a cheerful heart. Okay. Number three. Psalm 37, verse 28. This is kind of what kickstarted this, this whole thing. This is what kickstarted the whole thing. It says this, For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints, which is by itself is a really powerful part of the verse. They are preserved forever, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. I think that's awesome. So uh, it was God's justice. I want to talk about it because we, I'm sure people are like, oh, justice, like social justice. No. I just want to say right now, this is not the same thing as social justice. There's only one kind of justice in the Bible and it's justice. God's justice is so good and it's so complete. Uh, and if we believe in God and we believe in what he says about justice, we will have a full orb picture of what justice looks like in the world. Um, so I just want to say that first, but think about this. It was God's justice that put Jesus to death. Cause remember how we just talked about this for God to love the world that he gave his only begotten son. We, deserve justly to die for our sin. That's the beginning of the gospel is recognizing who we are in this world. We are sinners 
deserving wrath from God because he is a perfectly just, perfectly holy God, and we are not holy, and we have missed the mark or sinned, and we have fallen short of the glory of God. So it's God's justice that put Jesus to death. So think about this. He loved his son, and we're going to learn about that in a little bit, put him to death for his people he also loved, and then Jesus was resurrected, and now he has his son in glory and his people in glory. <laughs> which is awesome. So his justice in perfect fulfillment brings salvation to the whole world for those who believe. Uh, That's incredible. So that's full, complete justice that all men deserve death, but because of what Jesus did, all men can have life. We don't deserve life because we've done, there's nothing in us that we've done that would give us justly um, freedom. Only Christ did that because the only way we could be justified is if the penalty of our transgression was paid for. The requirement of the law must be fulfilled and it was fulfilled in Jesus. So what, shouldn't we love justice too? Like, thank God <laughs> he's completely just and justified us in Jesus Christ. That he didn't just pretend sin didn't exist. He didn't just say like, oh, I'm not even going to think about all those simple things you did. And I'm not going to think about the 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 wrath that you deserve. I'm just, that would not be a just God. That would be a unjust God. Him just pretending like nothing happened. Think about a judge who sees a case and there's a murderer on the trial. And the judge just says, you know what? I'm just going to forget about the murder. What? It's not a big deal. What about the family that like that, that? That's not justice. There has to be punishment and payment for the crime. Instead, what happens is you know, and we've heard the, the story before. The lawyer says, I will take the punishment, right? So th- this is what we see. This is, there's, there's, God loves justice and he fulfilled his justice in Jesus Christ so that we can be justified. And if that doesn't make you love justice and just love God even more. Okay, so I just want to uh, dig into this idea of, of God loving justice and how good it is that he fulfilled his justice in Christ. Because uh, listen to what happens if we don't receive the gift that God gave us in his son, Jesus. If we, if we don't let Jesus take God's wrath on himself in second Thessalonians one, eight through nine, it says this dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. That's what we deserve. But because of Christ, we don't receive that. Mm Mm-hmm. If we believe in Jesus Christ, that he is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved from that punishment that we, that every man and woman on earth deserves. That's the gospel. So we should love that God because he's just, Mm -hmm. we don't want to love an unjust God. We want a God that is fully just and fully good. Otherwise he's a corrupt God, but he can't be corrupt because he's fully just. So we, we got to love justice. We got to love wrongs being righted, Mm -hmm. penalties being paid, punishment being dealt. Those things sound bad, but they're good because that's what a good God, a good judge, a good system does. Mm -hmm. Because there are things that are wrong that need to be dealt with. Thank God he dealt with them. God doesn't just let our sin go undealt with. He actually deals with our sin. And that's just incredible. So we should love that justice because it's the right way and it's the way God has dealt with everything. So that he's not just forgetting about it, pretending it didn't happen. He's dealing with it completely, utterly sending it into oblivion. Last verse in this list idea of justice, Revelation 21 verse four, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall be, there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. So this is the hope we have to look forward this to is the hope. because of what Jesus did. Because of the justice that God dealt out on his son, Jesus, mm-hmm. that he paid for our sins and we put our belief in him. As it tells us in John three sixteen. this is what our hope, where our hope lies. No longer in the eternal destruction, but in eternal you know, healing, eternal paradise, peace. Mm-hmm. Okay, why don't you read the next one? Okay, uh, Psalm eleven seven. For the Lord is righteous; He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold His face. Hmm. It's good. Yeah, this is so probably righteous, like, God loves righteousness. 
he loves righteousness. He loves right living. He loves righteous deeds yeah. specifically. So it says he, the Lord is righteous. So he can't love the opposite of that wickedness. <laughs> and we actually know this because he says he hates wicked, mm -hmm. hates the wicked, but he loves righteous deeds. So he likes it when, not likes it, he loves it when we walk in the good deeds that we see Jesus walk in. Mm -hmm. When we love people, when we're compassionate, when we're caring, when we're generous, when we're these things that the Bible uh, directs believers to do in the power of the Holy Spirit, of course, he loves it. He loves those things. So, I mean, that one probably goes without much description, but do we love righteousness? Do we, do we love uh, righteous deeds? When you think of righteous deeds, what do you, what do you think of Jennifer? I just think of um, doing the right thing. I think of being a moral person. I think of uh, obeying God and all that he's commanded in his word. So it's just a, I mean, just if you look at your own life, now this isn't like a works thing. So we're like going to do all these righteous things and that's going to make us righteous. But in Christ, through the Holy Spirit, when we walk the way God walk, walk, calls us to walk with each other, with our spouse, with our children, with our the other believers in the body of Christ, uh, with our neighbors, with unbelievers, mm -hmm. God loves it. He loves it when he sees his children walking out the things that he's prepared for us to walk out in, those mm -hmm. good deeds, the righteousness that he's given us. And we should love it too. We should love righteousness. We should we should cheer on when we see someone walking yeah. in righteousness. Yeah, our kids, our spouse, friends. And we should let them and be like, praise God. God loves the way you're walking right now. Mm -hmm. God loves that thing you did. And not get jealous of it, not uh, critique it. Is it? I mean, maybe critique is necessary. It depends on what it is. But I'm just saying, like, if you see someone walking somewhere, say, God loves what you're doing. God mm -hmm. loves that. That's cool. And um, I would say that it's his it's his love for us and within us that motivates us to want to be righteous. Absolutely. And the Holy Spirit that empowers us to even do it. Yeah. Because we can't do it in the flesh. Mm -hmm. And uh, that Psalm that I read, it's not the only place that says this. Um, another Psalm would be 146, 8. It says, the Lord loves the righteous. Proverbs 15, 9. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves him who pursue, pursues righteousness. Yeah. And I think about... Uh, on that's that's Proverbs verse. First John mm -hmm. says, "He who uh, he who practices righteousness is righteous," and he uses this idea of like practicing it. Like, are we getting better at becoming righteous like Christ? Are right. we? Are we? Is it something that we're over time learning tricks of the trade, or I should say, like we're getting better at it? <laughs> yeah. Practice, you know, constitutes getting better at something. Yeah, don't get hung up on your imperfection because I mean, I'm someone who does this too. If something's not done perfectly. I want to throw my hands up in the air and get frustrated. But like what you're saying is practicing that righteousness, you yeah. will get better over time because you're making a choice for it every, every day. Yeah. And God loves it. He loves those things that we're practicing and growing in and moving forward towards and, and walking in. Okay. So move on to number five. Again, we're talking about things that God loves. Hosea three, one. Okay. And to the Lord, oh, and the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to the to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So it's it, kind of random. Yeah, but it, it, what Hosea is talking about, Hosea was a, a prophet and God's using Hosea to show the people of Israel how they've committed adultery on, on God, mm -hmm. how they've abandoned his relationship with them, their covenant, like a marriage. And he uses Hosea to do that. But in this verse, he's saying, go again and love a woman who has loved another man. So he's saying, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go love Israel, even though Israel has cheated on me, left me, turned their face away from me, worshiped other gods, right? And he's saying, go, go love a woman like that because that's what I'm going to do. God has always loved Israel and he's not going to stop. That hasn't changed. I don't care what anyone says. God still loves Israel, okay? Now, it, he loves the whole world, right? He said that. So this isn't to say like, oh, he loves Israel more. But for anyone to say that God doesn't love Israel, they haven't read the word of God. Yeah. Because right here, it says the Lord loves the children of Israel and he has not changed his mind on this. And so at minimum, we should also love mm -hmm. the children of Israel. We should mm -hmm. look at Israel, the Jews and say, man, I love those people. Because think about this. You should, Jennifer, you sent, you sent me a video of... Um, these Christian, um, what were they? They were uh, 
Messianic Jews. They were mm-hmm. Christian Jews. Mm-hmm. So they're Jew by, uh, by, so they were, they were Christians, but they were Jewish. So they loved Jesus and they're just talking about why that, what, what their faith means and what, and how they fit into the picture. And they talked about how Jesus was a Jew. All the apostles were Jews. The first Christians, guess who they were? Jews. And that's an incredible thing. We cannot forget that as people of, of Christ, we cannot just throw that out and be like, nope, it's always been Gentiles only. No, actually, the, it, the first church started with Jews. Jesus himself was one. All of the apostles, Paul included, Jew. And so when I think about it saying God loves Israel, I think we should have a heart for Israel. And babe, I've loved seeing you because you love, you love learning about Israel. I find it fascinating. History, yeah. And reading about what's going on in the in, in Israel and the people I, I and pay the, attention, the language even. I pay attention to um, headlines in the news for like recent discoveries and stuff because they have unearthed You're talking about excavations. Yeah, and, so yeah. much history and um things that support the Bible and the yeah. history of the Bible. And so I I do um I have a love for Israel. So at the, minimum, friends, we should love Israel also. I don't know what that means, but we should love those people just like we love everyone, but we should look at it and say, man, God loves Israel. I, I pray that there's a mass revival in Israel, that these Jew- the Jewish nation would come to know the Lord in droves, that they would recognize that the God that they worship sent his son, Jesus, mm-hmm. to be the Messiah. He was the Messiah. He was the anointed one. He was the Christ, theirs and ours. Yeah. All right, let's jump into the next one. Okay, so number six is John 16, 27. This is Jesus talking. And he says, For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. And guess who he's talking to? The disciples. He's talking to his disciples. So he's saying, For the Father himself loves you, disciples, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. And what's awesome about this is because the disciples believed before everyone else did, Mm -hmm. before Jesus even died on the cross or ascended into heaven or showed himself to them after he resurrected, they believed. And I think that's an incredible thing because we believe and get to have the Holy Spirit right now. They believed amidst him being alive and walking with them as a man. Mm -hmm. Like imagine if a man was standing right next to you right now. He's like, I'm Jesus. I'm the Messiah. And you're like, excuse me? (laughs) (laughs) Are you sure about that? So they believed then. Mm -hmm. They were some of the first to believe. And he's just pointing out, he's like, God, my father loves you because you have believed that I, he sent me Mm -hmm. and you love me. And so God loved the disciples. They had a big job to do. They had a huge job. (laughs) They literally were starting the church and giving the full revelation of Jesus Christ to the world Mm -hmm. through the epistles, through Paul, through the the letters that we were going to receive after Jesus ascended into heaven. If they, if they weren't fully convinced of God's love, none of that would have happened. No, nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I want to point out something. If there's any of the disciples writings in the Bible that you have qualm with for some reason, just know this, God loves the disciples <laughs> and he loves the things that he wrote, they wrote, and he loves their epistles. And so when we read the, the New Testament and we read letters from the disciples and we read their gospel accounts, we can know that they are true and we should right? Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to give a little bit of credibility, extra credibility. Like <laughs> if you've had any doubt before, do not doubt mm-hmm. that the word of God is inerrant and perfect and breathed and inspired by God. All right. So uh, the last one we're going to share with you guys, maybe we should have started with because Possibly, he's been yeah. from the beginning, uh, but God loves his son. They are one and yeah. In love. <laughs> so John 10, 17, for this reason, the father loves me. Again, this is Jesus talking because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. He loves his son. Another one is John 15, nine, as the father has loved me. So I have loved you. And then he tells us very specifically abide in my love. <laughs> so God loves his son, mm-hmm. Jesus. Therefore we should too. <laughs> Yeah. It's a simple one, but this is these are the the handful of verses that I found that specifically say w- something that God loves. Mm-hmm. And I think they should I mean apparently they're not- they're notable. Like, oh, these are specific 
it's almost like the gospel story. <laughs> there's justice. There's his word. There's righteousness. righteousness there's, uh, the, you know, his disciples. There's being a cheerful giver. The world. <laughs> there's, yeah, giving. Because for God so loved the world, he gave, gave. cheerfully his son. <laughs> Think about it. Yeah. All of these things have something to do with each other. It's cool. So it just makes this one big picture of the gospel, right? The mm-hmm. good news of Jesus Christ and the salvation we receive in him because we've believed in him. Mm-hmm. And uh, so... Fun little episode talking. <laughs> it's it. essentially like a little study that I, w- I went through. And I just, I, I want to encourage our listeners to dig in themselves yeah. as a couple. F- figure out, you know, what, how these can apply to your life. How, you know, what more deeper meaning can you find in them? Uh, follow the rabbit trails when you see those little letters next to the words, you know, in some of these verses. Those are called uh, cliff note or footnotes. You look at that letter and it, it relates to another scripture. And go find that other scripture and, and follow those little trails and see what you come up with. We also just want to encourage you to um, consider how God's love is truly transformational. Like Aaron said, all these verses that we shared today, um, you know, have to do with each other, have to do with the gospel. And that is what has changed us as believers and has transformed our lives and also has transformed our marriages. Um, and I would hope you guys would you know, be able to be a testament of that same power. Um, And so look at your life, look at your marriage, uh, look at your spouse and see how God's love has transformed you guys. Talk about it. Yeah. And let it continue to transform you. Yeah. I feel like the more I learn about God, his word, his son, Jesus, the gospel, his love for me, the more I want to change, the more humble I become, the more I, I want to give up all of the, anything that's of myself. Uh, and it's a, it's a slow process at times, but when I think about how much he's forgiven in me, how much he's justified me, what he's given me for, for something I could never pay for, it makes me want more <laughs> of him. <laughs> and so uh, that's our prayer for you. We am um, uh, speaking of prayer. We, Uh, like to end our episodes in prayer. And so we're going to do that right now. Would you join us? Dear Lord, thank you for your steadfast love. Thank you for loving us even yet while we were still sinners. Thank you for showing us in your word what you love. We pray that we would abide in your love every day. We pray your love would manifest in our hearts and pour into our relationships with others. May your love change us and transform us. May your love radically impact our marriages by the way we love our spouse. Help us to understand even more deeply your love for us and receive it with a humble heart. We pray we would show you our love by obeying your word and keeping it. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, thank you for so much for joining us on this episode. Uh, as usual, we just want to remind you, please leave us a review and a rating. And also, uh, we look forward to having you next week. Did you enjoy today's show? If you did, it would mean the world to us if you could leave us a review on iTunes. Also, if you're interested, you can find many more encouraging stories and resources at marriageaftergod.com and let us help you cultivate an extraordinary marriage. 